All right, I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of Joshua Basin Water District for Wednesday, February 7, 2018. Please rise and join Ray in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Determination of the quorum. Madam President, all five directors are here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Before we go into public comment, I wanted to give time to Tom McCarthy, who's the general manager of Mojave Water Agency. For those of you who heard about that, this is the man in charge who'd like to say a few words. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. It, it doesn't amplify, but we use it for recording. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the time and uh, and the recognition just planning to stand with everybody else. Uh, uh, my name is Tom McCarthy. I'm, I'm, I still consider myself new. I believe I'm in my eighth month. Uh, replaced Kirby Brill. Um, big shoes to fill. Uh, the good news is we have a great staff at Mojave and we have great stakeholders like yourselves. So we've got uh, great momentum going forward. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to be here uh, to be in front of, of this board, um, as I haven't yet, but we have a, a milestone in front of us that I, I thought was great, and, I, and your staff, I think, agrees. Uh, we now have a, a storage agreement uh, that we've reached between Mojave Water Agency um, and Joshua Basin Water District um, that uh, allows for what I think is tremendous uh, reliability and redundancy for your uh, residents and constituents. Um, so it was an opportunity with this agreement in front of us now to, to really show my face and uh, one, say thank you to this region for uh, board members like yourselves uh, and constituents like you have that, that make the trip, because I know how long it is, <laughs> make the trip up to Mojave Water Agency to voice your opinion and let us know what's important. Um, but two, uh, for staff as well to, you know, work out things, uh, a pleasure to work with, uh, very reasonable uh, so we can hammer out agreements that need to be hammered out. And, and as I joked with Kurt that, you know, we're not always going to be here. So we've got to make sure that the agreement is reasonable for, for all parties. And, and that was, uh, you know, a pleasure. And I, I know it was being worked on quite a while before I got here. So uh, I probably had the easy part just wrapping it up. <laughs> Um, but uh, really, I, I just wanted to uh, um, say hello. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, and I look forward to continuing to do so in the future. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm open to questions if the board has time, but uh, I understand. Sure. We have time. Does anyone have a question about the Is there Your name, please. Uh, I just want to real quick. It doesn't have to be uh, about me. Did you ask uh, Jeff and Tor to come over once in a while because he's our second uh, district area representative? Could you have him come over and give us a little outline about what's going on with the water district? I, I will. I will pass on your comment to Jim. Uh, Director Ventura tries to get around, uh, but uh, I'll definitely pass on along your comment. Uh, he lives right here in Joshua. Yes, he does. Anybody else? Thank you very, very much. And I'll just echo it. It's a real joy working with the staff of the Mojave Water Agency and uh, with Tom. He's uh, he stepped right in, as you all know from attending their, their board meetings. So. Yeah, that's true. Kirby were huge shoes to fill, and Tom has been amazing. I mean, you just, you're perfect. So it's really, really <laughs> nice to have you there and to have someone that we can work with so easily. And she sure. doesn't say perfect very often. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Almost never. All right, well, that will go to public comment. This is a time set aside for public comment on any district related matter not appearing on the agenda. Government codes prohibit the board from taking action on these items, but they may be referred for future consideration. Please state your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Oh, the approval of the agenda. You want to do that first? Okay. <laughs> I move that we approve the agenda. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. With that, do I have to start over? No, ma'am. No. <laughs> 
Government code prohibits the board from taking action on these items, but they may be referred for future consideration. Please state your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Do we have any public comment? Yes, we can. My name's Ed Beller. I'm an account owner here in Joshua Tree. I've uh, been for years going to the 29 Palms meetings, and uh, at some times in the past, years ago, it was, it was a little bit more stormy there occasionally, which uh, Ray may uh, attest to. And uh, I've only been coming to these meetings for about three months when I saw the projections for the uh, increase in the rates. Uh, I've also heard, during that time, I've heard multiple times about the uh, water leak at the farmer's market, but I haven't seen anything concrete. And I've passed out to the board and a number of the people a copy of the report that's part of the monthly thing in 29 pounds. In it, you know, they don't go into the treatment plant and stuff that's a normal routine business. But in it, you know, they have all the abnormal stuff, like responded to 32 underground service leaks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would like the board to put this for future consideration to ask your operations people to give us something concrete. You talk about the leaks. If this thing starts to show that we're getting 30 leaks, you know, a month, it substantiates a panic mode. If it's just one, then it isn't so bad. But some good engineering data like this, I think, is extremely important, and I think it needs to be given to the public. And so I handed it out, and I'm not saying the same thing as 29 pounds, but it was just a straw man upon which I would like to see you, you know, you present. I've also got a request for data. You know, as you've heard me talk before, uh, I've had heartburn with the estimated cost of the meter replacement versus what I've seen in 29 palms. And to better understand it, I really need to see the data. So could you pass this down to Kurt? That's a data request for a copy of the cost data used to price the $2.5 million meter replacement number used in the rate study, including vendor copies of quotes on meter and electronics sending units. I really would like to see something concrete. It's what I get wired with every time the government audited me. They wanted concrete data. I would like to see some concrete data to understand it better. I do not understand the radical disparity in the cost of putting meters in 29 pounds, where they have one and a half times the number of meters of Joshua Tree. And there's a soapbox, I think, that I, is showing up in tomorrow's paper. And I appreciate that people read it. Thank you very much. Thank you. No more kids in the community. I would like to say that I concur with Ed, with everything that he has said and what he has said in the past about the uh, meters and repairs and rate increases and so on. Uh, but my comment is uh, has to do with uh, we lost a very good and important person in our community, Jerry Lee Wilson. He had been a uh, resident of Joshua Tree since back in the 70s. And uh, at one time, uh, he was an employee of Joshua Basin Water District for a period of years. And then he was also a uh, board member for nine years until recently. And I, I'd like to read a little about his obituary. Uh, he was a good friend of many of us in the community. Of course, he had friction with some of the board members that we've had in the past and ones that we have now. But uh, Gary Wilson was a 77-year-old uh, uh, year resident of California and a 48-year resident of Joshua Tree. He passed away at the age of 77. Uh, he was born uh, March 16th of 1940 in San Diego. Following high school, he served in the United States Army for three years from 1959 to 1962. Uh, following a 30-year career in pipe construction working for the International Union of Operating Engineers, he spent retirement restoring old cars and going to auctions in uh, Yucca Valley with his wife and other areas. In 1999, he went to work for the Joshua Basin Water District and in 2005 appointed to the Board of Directors for nine years. 
and he is preceded by his father and mother, and also a sister and a wife. He's survived by a daughter, a, wilt, uh, a granddaughter, and uh, some other members of his family. But last but not least, he was good friends with many of us in the community, and one person he uh, mentioned was uh, Iona Shillette and one of the board members, Tom Fulwin. Um, like I said, uh, he was a good uh, member of our community, and uh, I respected him immensely as when he was an employer of Charles Beach and Water District and also as a board member. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we will be adjourning in his memory tonight. You're absolutely right. Tom, if you wish to leave, please know that any time you can discuss it. I Anyone else on public comment? Seeing none, we will move on to the consent calendar. Items on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted in a single motion without discussion. Any board member or member of the public may request that an item be removed from the consent calendar and acted on separately. To the, uh, this one is the minutes of draft minutes of the January 17, 2018 meeting. Do I have a motion? President Huffman, I, may, I need to make one change to the oh, yes, sir. And that is on page 9 of the board packet. Item number, page 5, thank you. Uh, page 5, item number 12, the District General Council Report. The last okay. sentence reads, generally speaking, that pursuant to property 218, and the correction is that it should read, generally speaking, that right pursuant to property 218, R-I-G-H-D. Okay. So with that change, do I have a motion for the consent calendar? Madam Chair, I'd like to take a comment on your consent calendar. El Marquez, uh, Central Community. Uh, on the consent calendar, on the minutes of the previous meeting, um, And, uh, see, uh, item number 10 on the, on, the, uh, on the minutes of the last meeting, it showed a public comment period after uh, the discussion on the Mojave Water Agency. And uh, it says here that uh, myself, Al Marquez of Joshua Creek, referred to what he thought was a USGS report of 2010, where the water levels of well 14 rose from 2004 to 2006, 2008 to 2010. Well, I just gave uh, documented proof to uh, both the Vice President and the President that, uh, just before the meeting that, uh, that the comment that I made was the uh, official document from uh, USGS about the water levels of those dates that I just specified. So I would uh, ask that the uh, board would uh, correct that uh, comment and, uh, and comment exactly what uh, I had uh, commented on. Thank you. Yes, we'll take care of that. Thank you very much, Al. Okay, with that, is there a motion to approve the draft minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. And the uh, consent calendar is approved. We're going to move to item number seven. Do you want to take that? Sure. <coughs> so um, tonight, Mr. Adam Ortega of Ortega Strategies Group is here to speak about legislation. And uh, with him, accompanying him, is the world-renowned general manager of the Cunningham <laughs> Crown <laughs> uh, Ray Kalish. And they have both just returned from Sacramento today. I don't know if you were there for one or two days, but... Ray would like to start off with uh, uh, a little background. I guess he's uh, been working with uh, the strategies group, um, Ortega Strategies, uh, for a couple years. And uh, we've had several meetings with various water districts. And Ray would like to say a few words, and then Don will uh, go through his presentation. Well, thank you, Kurt. Uh, 
Good evening, board, members of staff. Uh, again, my name is Ray Kolish, the world-renowned uh, <laughs> general manager of the 29th Palm Swanton District. I'm here tonight just to uh, give a little background uh, of myself. I've been in the water industry, industry for 31 years, uh, 27 of those years working in a special district, including this district here back in the late 80s. And when I reflect back to all the regulations that agencies have to conform with, and I look at, well, what did we do to maybe combat that or fight those? And there wasn't much done. I know in 29 Ponds, we, we have fluoride issues. We have arsenic issues. And those regulations impacted us very heavily, just like the Chrome 6 issue that has impacted many of us, including the Joshua Basin Water. So I, I decided that in 2017 that we start our own legislative committee to try to be more active in Sacramento and have more of a voice in Sacramento for special districts like ours that are disadvantaged communities and sometimes severely disadvantaged communities like we are in 29 Palms. So we started working with uh, a Don Ortega, with the Ortega Strategies Group uh, back in, I think, late 16, early 2017. And, and Don has been able to guide us uh, on that aspect of the legislation uh, practice and, and, and procedures up in Sacramento. It's something that, you know, frankly, I wasn't very familiar with and sometimes scared to death of. So we started working with the Don, and one of the things we did recently was the whole Chromium 6 issue, as we well know. Um, you know, there was a coalition that was formed to challenge the Chromium 6 MCL. Um, we did prevail. We assisted Adon with providing information to the courts of the true cost of these treatments that the state seems to not do their due diligence on finding out. So today, it was very clear to me when I was up in Sacramento um, that there needs to be more of a voice from special districts like ours. And the dialogue I've had with your general manager is, you know, how can we get together talk about our similar problems and go to Sacramento and have maybe more of a voice from special districts like ours. There's a lot of uh, advocates supporting a lot of the issues that are impacting the Central Valley and doesn't seem to be those voices coming from, you know, desert regions like ours. So that's kind of the background of what we started. Uh, again, today was a real eye-opener for me. Uh, we have two of my board members here tonight. Uh, Board member Bob Coghill and board member Carol Giannini, which those are the two members of our legislative committee, and they accompanied us up to Sacramento today, and uh, we, we rushed to get here uh, from uh, Ontario as we flew back. So <laughs> with that, I would like to introduce Don Ortega, and he can uh, give a brief on some of the things that are going on that are in impacting us. So thank you, Reed. Thank you very much, Ray. Thank you. I'll try to make this as succinct and uh, clear as possible. I want to uh, pick off on the story that Ray told you about Chrome 6. Um, you know, there was a, a, a lawsuit that was filed against the standard. Um, there was a court judgment that invalidated that standard. Uh, and it was extremely important that the courts were informed um, in order for the judge uh, to be able to understand to what degree the small system issues uh, were not properly considered. And in fact, we prevailed on the Attorney General not to appeal the case. You would think that would have been enough, but I'm going to tell you another story. And this happened the month after. The very month after the Chrome 6 um, standard was invalidated, uh, the board approved a standard for 123 TCP. Many of us supported that standard because we were up against the statute of limitations in order to be able to file claims against the responsible parties to recover the cost of treatment. A board member asked the staff explicitly, what did you do differently in the adoption of the TCP standard than what you did on Chrome 6? And the staff said, nothing. We did nothing differently. So no sooner does that happen, they adopt the, the standard for 123 TCP, TCP. There's about 100 systems, like 93 systems across the state that are impacted. Many of them can't afford the remedy. There was no compliance period. We supported the standard, but requested that the board adopt a compliance period so that people could recover the money that it's going to take to install the treatment systems. The board said no, because they said that if they adopted a compliance period, it would mean the disadvantaged communities would get their clean water last. 
Well, the fact of the matter is that without a compliance period, you're, you, you still can't afford it. It doesn't solve anything. And um, you know, I try not to laugh when I, when I hear those comments, but it's, it's a laugh of incredulity because it's hard to believe that that would be um, a viable argument. But we're told that that argument prevails because of who it is that's advocating for these issues uh, in Sacramento right now. Uh, the overarching theme of what's happening in Sacramento is that there are measures to accrue powers to the State Water Resources Control Board to determine statewide standards in a way that's um, expanded from what you would expect. Uh, the State Water Board has the power to set uh, maximum contaminant levels, but there's extra steps that are being taken um, or things that are not being done, like the allowance of compliance periods uh, to comply with these standards. And uh, it's the same with conservation, as you'll hear shortly. Um, and with the bill that you're going to hear about shortly, it's the same about agency governance, um, given some of the things that are being considered. Much of this, as we've already stated, is coming from pleas that are coming from many nonprofits in the Central Valley, uh, where uh, you know they've been very effective. Uh, they've done a lot to bring clean water to communities in the Central Valley that don't have uh, access to safe drinking water. But on the other hand, the solutions that are being applied to the Central Valley are also being interpreted as appropriate for the rest of the state. Um, and that's something that needs to be addressed, <coughs> I believe, and I think given Ray's example, by the local representatives, the elected representatives of many of these disadvantaged communities. Um, that unless you step up, and unless you step up, you'll be left adopting measures that will drain your ability to keep your local revenues working for the people here, uh, that may uh, leave you implementing conservation programs that make sense in LA, but that may not make a lot of sense for the kind of weather and topography that you have here. Um, and. Uh, that may leave you absorbing the costs of other systems uh, that for various reasons can't afford uh, the remedies. But to give you the up to the minute on the bills, I want to introduce you to my colleague, uh, Denise peralta -Gailey. Uh Denise has been with me for five years. Uh, she's a former legislative aide, uh, very active in political circles, knows many legislators, uh, has a master's in public administration, so she understands the nuances of governance. So. Denise, if you can please give us the up to the minute on the bills while we sure. were flying here. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, so I want to do a quick overview of each bill and then maybe go into some detail on it because I think you'll find it quite interesting, maybe as interesting as I found it when I was reading through these, these uh, legislative bills. So some of the bills that are moving forward through the legislature right now that I think are of interest, um, AB, let's see, conservation language. Last year, the governor um, proposed or released um, Executive Order B3716. It's making conservation a California way of life. That mandate essentially um, moved forward in the form of legislation. There was legislators in Sacramento that introduced various pieces of legislation, some of which reflected the language in the governor's mandate and others that didn't. Um, that legislation didn't move forward. Um, last year, there was a lot of opposition by Aqua and a lot of other um, water stakeholders. Um, this year, the legislation is going to move forward, uh, but there was no changes as of yet. That's what I've been told from staff in Sacramento. Um, we have a lot of concerns with it because some of the language in one of the bills is very stringent on indoor water use targets, and I know for this region that would be a big problem. Um, Something that I also wanted to mention is that there is one bill, there's three bills total, and one of them is considered a, a compromise bill. So the bill would essentially mandate that a stakeholder work group convene and gather input from stakeholders to really put together a vehicle that isn't just looking at one perspective on water, but really a water agency's perspective as well. Um, 
I know the California Association of Mutual Water Companies <coughs> submitted a comment letter supporting that legislation uh, last year. So we're hoping that that's the vehicle for the governor's <coughs> mandate moving forward. Um, something else that came about this year, it's new legislation, it's um, ACA 21, it's Assembly Constitutional Amendment 21 by Assemblyman Chad Mays. Um, a constitutional amendment is essentially requires a two-thirds majority and also is, would be, have to go to the ballot. So it would require voter approval. What it would do is it would create an infrastructure fund, so about 2.4 to 2 $2.8 billion would be put into this fund from the general fund. So this isn't a new tax. It's essentially money that would be reallocated from the general fund to invest in infrastructure improvements, including water infrastructure. Um, another bill <laughs> that uh, I find very interesting, and I'm sure you may have heard of this, it's SB 998 by um, Senator Dodd. It's yeah. a water shutoff bill. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to go over the summary and then I kind of want to go into some detail because I found the language to be very interesting. So the bill would prevent a water utility from shutting off service to a customer any sooner than 60 days of payment delinquency and only upon, upon finding the local help by, by the local health department. Department. The bill creates requirements for notifying delinquent customers and creates penalties against the water utility if the requirements are shown not to have been followed. The bill would exempt families whose head income earner is in prison or has been deported from service shutoff. So I wanted to go into some detail if that's okay. If I go too long, feel free to stop me. But if you go into and read the language of the bill, Basically, it would require an agency to have a written policy on residential service shutoff available not only online, but mailed to each customer and updated every single year. It also would require that that policy be made available in English and Spanish and would, um, and in any other language spoken by at least 5% of the population. It would also... Uh, let's see, it would also set forth um, the agency would have to, as an agency, you would have to contact the local health department. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to shut off somebody's service, you have to notify them at least three days before shut off. However, you also have to contact the local agency health department who then has to determine whether or not that shut off would pose grave threat to health and safety of the residents. So. When I'm reading this, one of the things that popped into my mind is if I'm the local health department, I'm thinking about what are the liability, right? What's my liability if I say no? Also, what's the administrative costs? You know, what, what does the local health department have to have in-house in order to move this, this forward? Also, procedural concerns. Um, who decides what the metrics are? If I have to decide if somebody's if, some, if shutting off service is going to pose grave danger, I'm have, having to think what am I going to have? To, what do, how do I determine what 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 would subs what would uh, be considered grave danger to somebody's health? Um, and what are the trade offs? So as an agency, that's something that has to be considered. Um, it would also require this bill would also require a water system to waive reconnection fees and offer a reduction waiver of or on interest char charges on delinquent bills for a residential customer that's demonstrated uh, to be a disadvantaged community or I should say demonstrated household income below 200 percent of the federal poverty line. Um, one thing that I wanted to that I was I as I was reading this I thought of is that this in the bill's language it states that this requires this is a California Constitution requires the state to reimburse the local agency and school districts for certain costs mandated by the state so since this is a mandated program the language in the bill states that the, the state would have to provide a reimbursement however that exact language is also if you read AB 746, which was passed last year, it's a lead testing bill requiring community water systems to test for lead. Um, that same language was in that bill. And I've been in communication with the State Board about where the reimbursements yeah, to yeah. water agencies are for the testing. And what they specifically told me is that they're not legally right. required to provide a reimbursement, right. even though the language of the bill stipulates that a reimbursement has to be made. 
So I just found that to be very interesting and I'm curious not just what everyone in the water community has to say about, about it, but also what other <coughs> stakeholders have to say. For instance, the Apartment Association, HOAs, um, this has a, I think it has a various concerns for various stakeholders. So um, moving on to the next bill. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. Last year there was a bill introduced by the same senator that's introduced the water shutoff bill, Senator Dodd. He introduced SB 623, which is the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. It's a meter charge, a per meter charge of 90, starting at 95 cents. Um, this month, February 1st, the Department of Finance posted on its website trailer bill language. What that means is that the language in that bill now moves into a trailer bill. A trailer bill bypasses committees, it bypasses a normal legislative mm -hmm. process. So in other words, it doesn't have the checks and balances that normal legislation um, has. Um, in the language um, that's posted on the Department of Finance's website, it says that Starting at 95 cents, so for a customer with a water meter that is less than 90, that is that less than or equal to one inch in size, the fee shall be 95 cents per month. And I could go through every single one of these, but I'll just end with, for a customer um, with a water meter that is greater than four inches in size, the fee shall be $10 a month. So that would be to fund um, O&M for disadvantaged <coughs> communities. This would be the, the purpose of the fund. The exception um, to this would be any connection that is used um, exclusively for fire flow or uses or non-potable uses, so recycled water. And then the fee collection, um, a community water system shall collect the fee from each customer and may retain an amount uh, for reimbursement and reasonable cost reimbursement incurred associated with the collection of the fee not to exceed 4% of the amount collected. And then um, I think Ivan will talk a little bit about the concerns of the bill, but I just want to end with one last bill that I think I should mention today, and that's AB 2050. It was just released this week. It's um, a bill by Assemblywoman Ana Caballero, and that bill would create the Small Water System Authority. So right now the State Board has the authority to consolidate non-compliant systems. That includes managerial administrative consolidation. This bill would create a small water system authority that would have the powers to absorb, improve, and operate non-compliant systems. <coughs> and um, that would be under LAFCO and the Department of Drinking Water. Um, I also want to mention really quickly, hopefully I'm not getting too minutia, but um, I want to mention that this bill if it passed, would be enacted January 1st, but would require any non-compliant system to have a plan for compliance by July 1st. So if that system can't determine through a plan that it can be compliant by July 1st, the system would be automatically consolidated. So I think um, that's a pretty stringent timeline, and I'm not really sure, looking at the language, there's no as to what the plan would actually entail. So um, just something to keep in mind. Any questions? Thanks. No, you're scaring us <laughs> Well, I just wanted to close on, on that bill. It's a moving target because there has been uh, language that's that has been developed that would uh, possibly exempt uh, disadvantaged communities that reach a certain threshold of residents that are under the 200% median household right. income of the federal poverty line. Mm -hmm. um, if that happens, it could be that entities like uh, Joshua Basin and 29 Palms would be exempt from having to raise the revenue okay. from its residents. Uh, I've posed the question explicitly to the <coughs> resident, to the uh, proponents of the bill. I'm hoping that I'm going to get an answer within the next couple of days. Um, they very much would like the mutual water companies that are numerous in the state not to oppose the bill. Uh, I think that for many of the mutual water companies, that's going to be an important factor uh, to consider. Um, you know, uh, in, in paying tribute to Tom McCarthy and congratulating him for his, uh, for his job, I was recently uh, over in the Phelan area uh, meeting with a group of, of folks, including Kurt um, and Ray, uh, that are earnestly trying to find a way to uh, exert influence in Sacramento and uh, to present an alternative voice. 
Um, and what I want to tell you is that the way the dynamics work, yes, there's people from nonprofit organizations that mean well, that, that want to do good things for their communities. But because of the nature of the state, um, the dynamics of the Central Valley, uh, voices of the elected officials that represent people in those communities are not often heard. Um, if you ever go in front of a legislator, you'll find that above else, who they listen to are other elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, because they feel a sense of kinship for where you all come from as people that serve the same public. Um, so I know that Mojave has done a great job at coalescing many of the agencies in their area towards common causes uh, over the years. And I know, for example, they uh, ha a lot of the agencies in their area uh, had great data that was collected on the Chromium 6 case. Um, you're not the only region that is being left out. Um, in the Chromium 6 case, I came across many entities on the Central Coast that are similar to county water districts, community service districts. And there is a growing sentiment across the state to um, have those voices heard. Uh, some of the comments that Denise made today about um, this SB 623 and the, gov the governor's trailer, trailer bill, we've been hearing discussions in the San Gabriel Valley, for example, uh, where they have a lot of very prominent Democratic uh, legislators who are saying, hey, we've been collecting revenues from our residents. We've been raising rates where we have to. We've been applying for grants to address the largest Superfund site in a way that helps even the most disadvantaged communities. And if you do things the wrong way, it could result in their reduced capacity to galvanize their public and galvanize mm -hmm. their elected officials to do something for themselves. So that's what I want to leave you with. Um, we are talking about the formation of a loose confederation uh, of county water districts and community service districts uh, that we would call something like you know, the Community Water Systems Alliance from around the state. Um, at Ray's uh, request, I did talk to the officials at the Mutual Water Companies Association that represent a lot of small systems, and they've offered uh, to be the fiscal, the fiscal host until this group decides whether they want to set up their own profit, mm -hmm. nonprofit, or maybe not do anything at all. Um, but um, if, if you want, you know, there is an ability and um, a vehicle to coalesce with others such as yourselves. And then, you know, you also have other groups that uh, you can influence, like the Special Districts Association and others that are out there. So I want to leave you with, uh, I know Denise scared you, uh, but, <laughs> but there's hope. And if you, if you stand up and you, and you converge your energy with other um, systems, I think you'll find that you can have a voice. It doesn't have to, you know, cost you a ton of money, um, but it'll, it'll keep you organized. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and for listening to our report. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation. We will move forward and see where that goes. Great concept. I just came back from a three-day leadership academy at the special districts, and they are very concerned about this, and they are in Sacramento. And um, I've been, I've, I've been fearing that sac that. when they, when the drought regulations were enacted, and all the water districts had to start sending in their, their pumping, their monthly pumping compared to the year previous, it was like a no-cost way for Sacramento to see where the water was. It was like they were dowsing, <laughs> and and the and the, the fact that they could you know consolidate water districts is this authority to do that. It's very alarming to me. And uh, when I ran for this seat, I ran on a platform of don't let Sacramento take our water. And it's still my fear that they're, they're looking for where they can take water, consolidate to the state control. And uh, things like this that make it hard for small water districts to function. The cost of having to comply with some of this stuff is absolutely onerous. And everyone wants the best possible, safest drinking water. And none of these things are really helping us in that. And they're not addressing the drought. And we did have, we had another year of no snow and, and not the right kind of rain. And um, I think we're going to be gearing up for 
yeah. quite a onslaught from the state. Thank you guys for your work. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you guys for going up there too. <laughs> wow, that's good. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment from board? Seeing none, any public comments? Seeing none, thank you very, very much. It really was a, uh, an eye-opening uh, report. It's been a long day, so I hope you'll excuse me. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> please. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Very good. We will move on to item number eight, the SCADA contract. Uh, recommend the board authorize the district to enter into an agreement with the four shops that cost not to exceed $86,000. So. Okay, so Randy's going to give you a little presentation on what SCADA is and what we need to do with SCADA. Um, there's $86,000 that we're requesting approval tonight. <clears throat> I just want you to know that uh, I didn't take this to the Finance Committee first. Perhaps I should have, but uh, staff and I have reviewed the existing approved capital budget, and there is uh, sufficient money uh, available in the approved capital budget that will not be expended because we are not doing uh, several projects this year that were planned. So it's not an additional $86,000. It's moving money over from an approved capital budget to uh, take care of this first year of a five-year program, which Randy will now explain SCADA. And I've already reviewed it, and to the best of our abilities together, we've eliminated all acronyms. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, obviously, tonight we'll talk about the supervisory control and data acquisition, SCADA. Um, as Kurt mentioned, this is a one-year in a five-year program uh, to uh, bolster our existing infrastructure. But I want to give some context to what SCADA is, so you have an understanding of what that, um, how it operates for our system. First of all, SCADA operates 24-7. Uh, 365 days of the year. Uh, if you can think of a hospital, um, you can. Everyone knows going into a hospital into a care room uh, that you see an EKG machine. Um, it is something that's important for a nurse as well as a doctor to monitor the condition and health of the patient. In the same way, for uh, a nurse or a doctor, an EKG is a valuable tool. SCADA is a valuable tool, tool for our water production operators. So how this works, uh, we have here at the bottom left human HMI, human machine interface. This is where we give specific control um, parameters um, to talk about when pumps will start and shut down. Um, it will uh, send uh, information through the SCADA master to the communication network, which uh, in turn goes to remote terminal units. Um, those are the PLCs described in the uh, report. Um, there's primary and secondary locations for that uh, that are attached to sensors, and that goes towards our tanks. Um, that goes to our hydropneumatic stations, booster stations, etc., to uh, to put those control parameters into place. So that's essentially what happens. It's a line of sight communication. We have 96 square miles in our boundary, um, and so once again, we have primary. Uh, uh, locations and then uh, secondary or repeater sites um, that it works with. So that gives you a general idea. Uh, next slide. Just to bring it home, uh, most simplistically, uh, here we have our base station at our warehouse that's behind uh, our office here. Um, in addition, we have a park transmission site that's no longer active, but I figured it would be a good example to show uh, how communication kind of works from one site to another. Now we'll actually dive into these specific sites and show you what it controls, etc. Next slide. Control and monitoring. We have our well sites. Once again, it shows uh, when the wells will activate, um, as well as, as well as discharge uh, out to system for a period of time, and then it will um, serve potable water. Um, in addition to that, it will shut down at our well sites, and the commands for that are booster stations. Um, it will send controls there in order to lift water to uh, all the various locations in, in our district, um, about 1,800 uh, uh, feet of lift that we have to support through the 96 square miles um, and then our reservoirs itself controlling um, uh, the actual water levels inside. Next slide. 
Maintaining level and pressure. Obviously, we have our target there um, on the reservoir, which shows um, what our tank levels are so that we're maintaining uh, our fire control levels. The tank needs to at least be halfway full in order to maintain uh, fire conditions. So it handles that as well as our over 300 miles of pipeline, ensuring that we're um, we're maintaining uh, at a minimum 20 PSI and on average about 80 PSI for our customer base and so it's sending signals to our booster stations to make sure that our pumps are primed um, on a continu continual basis so that's uh, that's how we maintain our levels and our pressure next slide security uh, we enjoy graffiti uh, no one enjoys graffiti. Um, and so, once again, we have motion alarms that will tell us when uh, a perpetrator's on site. Uh, sometimes our, our folks like to take their quads or their bikes, and they, they like our hills on some very um, massive sites and, and uh, breaking into our gates and, and, and using it that way. Obviously, SCADA has prevented that. This is a very old photo here. Um, our hatches, making sure um, that... Uh, on the top of our reservoirs that things, uh, you know, no uh, uh, materials are, are added to the water um, as well as the security in itself. So once again, uh, we have two or three uh, safety parameters before you even get to the hatch. Um, and so um, that's how we maintain our security there. Uh, next slide. Energy uh, consumption reduction. Um, SCADA enables us to uh, over to save over $80,000 per year uh, because we're not out there manually turning on the pumps and motors. We can actually do them in off-peak <coughs> cycles. Um, and so essentially that's our savings that we, we obtain each year. Next slide. Emergency preparedness. Uh, as you guys know, uh, in the summer of last year, we had 40% of Joshua Basin um, that w uh, was a result of a main break. Uh, we had to do a precautionary boil order. Um, we, uh, we had some lessons learned from Joshua Tree that uh, too many in our area were unprepared for, for a bursting of the pipeline that was a freak accident that occurred. Uh, but once again, making sure we have a seven-day supply of water, et cetera. Uh, but I want to tell the story of how SCADA played a role in that. Um, SCADA allowed employees to respond prior to uh, getting even the first phone call from our customers into that area. And I know I, I haven't zoomed in here very closely, but in the top right of that computer screen, there's a reservoir, the C2 reservoir. It got down to two feet. Um, and had it run dry, we would have had other conditions uh, relating to, to the boil order that we would have had to, to do. So because our, our operators uh, were able to respond within one hour that tank uh, dropped by 12 feet um, and so they were able to respond very rapidly very quickly to uh, isolate that tank and serve water from two other sea reservoirs in that area um, so once again SCADA allows us to be prepared this is just one incident it's almost like you're going through heart surgery surgery everybody knows about that when heart surgery is going on but they, we have leaks uh, every single week, every single weekend, um, and SCADA prepares us uh, for things that you guys don't need to see. Um, that we maintain the, the quality and, and of our potable water system. And so that's what SCADA really essentially helps us do. Um, next slide. So once again, we've talked about the control and monitoring at uh, booster, well, and uh, pump sites, uh, maintaining level and pressures for target reservoirs, uh, as well as our uh, pressure stations, uh, security, making sure we're not getting sites that have graffiti or issues with our hatch, uh, safety, energy, consumption, saving, a savvy schedule that allows us to save $80,000 a year, and then also emergency preparedness uh, that allows us to be ready to go um, 365 days of the year. So at this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. <coughs> Wow, that's what we Thank you. Any questions from the board? Nope. Yeah. The uh, $80,000 in savings is broken now. Um, Southern California Edison okay. had done an analysis this year, and they, uh, excuse me, in 2017, that let us know that uh, because of a very savvy off peak schedule, we were saving roughly 80000 Nice. So I, I'm curious about what the deliverables are for year one. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we have, 
some um, obsolescence of our software that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, as you might have read in the report, uh, we have had um, this same type of technology in place since the 1980s and have done gradual up updates. We had a significant one, uh, a fairly significant one in 2015 with PLCs that were upgraded. Um, but now we have the actual software of the machine. I'm not going to mention for uh, security purposes what the, what the uh, software actually is. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want uh, for cybersecurity, et cetera. But sure. nevertheless, um, it's, it's being out of date. So now we need to upgrade mm -hmm. our machines as well as make all the remote sites applicable to, to our SCADA machine. And that convergence is supposed to happen in the next two years is what um, is projected. So this is a one year into that two-year convergence, uh, but ultimately 86,000 into a five-year plan of upgrades. Okay, thank you. I do have a, uh, I, I just want a clarification on the importance of, uh, of this kind of stuff. I talked briefly to Keith about this the other day. Um, I want to see if I have this right. So say if there's a, a pipe leak someplace, mm -hmm. like the big one that we had, uh, this SCADA system will detect that and then it may do things itself. Uh, for example, it could shut something off. Does it do that? Well, at present, there are some SCADA machines. Uh, for instance, 4Log is one instance where um, if we were doing a solenoid uh, clay valve um, that was connected to SCADA based off of a triggered mechanism could shut down um, a, a particular pipeline. What this does uh, at the moment um, and what's been doing since the 80s is it's provided us the ability to see uh, when we're seeing rapid flows come out of our tank sites. Um, and so that allows us to, uh, you know, we're constantly monitoring, seeing the trends that are going on. And so we can see, you know, is there a foot or two that's lost? And we can send some folks out in that area um, and to, to inspect and see if somebody, what's going on, whether somebody's pulling off of like a hydrant. Um, with significant volume, uh, maybe some stealing water or things of that nature. So, does so, that answer your question? Uh, when when you then uh, de detect these kinds of things in this enormously enormously complex system we have here of crisscrossing pipes, hundreds of miles of pipe, all that kind of stuff, you folks then can, uh, based on what the SCADA tells you, you could craft a solution to that apply that solution you know, so that people don't lose water at their houses. The solution is that you continue to provide water for people and all this whole system gets manipulated so that you can uniformly provide water to the whole system. And so then you could go back to SCADA and based on what SCADA tells you, you can determine the effectiveness of your solutions to the problem? That's correct. Bingo. Yeah. Okay. Very gotcha. well said. Okay. Excellent. Any comments from the public? Mr. Marquez. Uh, question. Uh, Please. Now, I'll just a real quick question. Uh, what, is, what is the initial uh, estimated cost to reinstall the SCADA? Uh, SCADA? The initial cost, are you talking about um, the cost to install a brand new system? What all the cost the, to reinstall it? Uh, the estimated cost? Generally perceived as is about a million dollars for a brand new, brand new system is is. is a million dollars. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Seeing none, you need a motion. Sure. Motion <laughs> 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 that the board authorize the district to enter into an agreement with Forshock for a cost not to exceed eighty-six thousand. Okay, do I have a motion? So I moved. <laughs> do I have a second? Second. second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded twice. And, uh, and is there any other discussion before we go to a vote? I just want to take this opportunity to point out to the board and the public that I could not have done that presentation. Thank you. <laughs> you did a great job, Randy. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in, we'll go roll call. Aye. Mr. Hunt. Aye. 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 And I'm an aye. It's unanimous. You have uh, <clears throat> the 
$86,000 because this is the brains of our, of our whole system and so it's really, really important. In my I thought Kurt was there. No, I gotta say, <laughs> Randy and production folks are the, all of the crew are the brains of the house. I should have said Kurt and staff, but I guess it's really Skato, right? I forgot about Kurt. How can I forget about Kurt? Oh, she didn't even go into that. Uh, we will move on to item number nine, the general council, district general council report. I'm not specific report as usual, but I do have a comment on the uh, report that Mr. and Mrs. Ortega Submitted, particularly uh, got my attention when they were advocated how, how important local lobbying is, especially if you group together. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're so different. You're so, this district is so different than Central California or Northern California, where they dominate the legislative process. And uh, that's uh, just a great uh, a notion to seriously consider at some point in time. And, and, uh, and uh, I really enjoyed Denise Ortega's. Uh, wrap up on the, on, on the legislation. The bill that you referred to is SB 998 by, by uh, Senator Dodd. He's out of Napa, California. I guess I have poor people up there too. I don't know. But he, 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 yeah, he just authored that bill Monday. He just tendered it Monday. So they were at the right spot yeah. today because it's, it's, it's hot, hot off the press. And it is, it is the, it's, it's in a bill that, that consolidates the turnoff procedures that are required a, a multitude of agencies, and they're all different. And it's trying to make them, wrap them all into one process uh, for uh, due diligence that a district's going to have to go through. You're going to have to take into consideration the family hardship of that particular customer, the peculiar circumstances that brought them to the po place in their situation where they can't pay their water bill. A lot of due diligence. Uh, it's going to be very expensive because it's going to require a lot of staff time to carry out that due diligence. I could, I could, I could feel Susan squirming <laughs> as Denise was speaking, <laughs> and rightfully so. But uh, it does uh, provide that if the commission approves uh, reimbursement from the state, and that's a big if, uh, even though Bill says it's a big if, you never know about the commission who approves uh, the reimbursement process. Uh, they can be a very, uh, that can be a very difficult task. But Senator Dodd is very powerful. He's very intelligent. Uh, he's, he is a senator who drafted the bill for and two years ago that mandated that the State Water Resources Control Board come up with a rate assistance program for low-income people. Mm -hmm. So you see the quest he's on. Yeah. You know, social, uh, social uh, responsibility, is what I can call it. He's pushing it down to the water community. Yeah. There's, there's good and bad. The bad is the cost. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that Sacramento was, is Calling the shots. Mm -hmm. Well, this bill just came out Monday, and I'll tell you, the buzz everywhere I went, my phone rang off the hook today. My emails were loaded with people. What's going on? And was said with this bill, mainly by the chief, by the chief financial officers of districts, because <laughs> that's what it goes down to. Yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. General Manager Report. Mr. Sauer. <laughs> So I just wanted to uh, address the uh, aquifer levels because uh, at the last board meeting it was suggested that the Joshua Tree aquifer had increased by some 50 to 60 feet in the uh, 2000s. Um, so this chart is actual data from our personnel doing soundings on the well uh, from 1982 uh, up through January 18th of this year. And you can see that we started at some 331 feet water below surface level, and it has declined fairly consistently uh, down to 365 feet, um, dropping some 34 uh, feet. And um, the uh, uh, 19 June of 14. Uh, water level at 385 and December of 15 at 385 are soundings that were taken in the casing and that those soundings are estimated because there's some 20 feet there was some 20 feet of oil on top of the water um, so the rest of them were taken in the column where there is no very minimal amount of oil so what our data shows that there's a, a one-foot drop 
annually over seven years, the last seven years, and 1.21 <coughs> dropped annually over 27 years. So I just wanted to clarify that for the board and for the public. Um, so um, <coughs> next topic is Chrome 6. And I don't know if you all recall the picture of my cat in the shower. I meant to put that up next, but I didn't tell Beverly. So Chrome 6 MCL. June 2014, out of compliance, another bill in January of 2015, 385 I think it was, we had three years to comply. We went to the state and were successful in getting a grant of 500000 and a loan of 2.1, zero interest loan. And we have spent to date approximately $250,000 out of the grant money and we've been reimbursed very promptly by the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, Susan's the happiest she's ever been about grant uh, reimbursements. <laughs> right. So we had put before uh, uh, the state division of finance the proposal that we that we use some grant monies to study stannous chloride, not reduction coagulation and filtration, but simply uh, reduction in coagulation. <laughs> Uh, basically following what the Coachella Valley Water District has done at the bench level. And they've now completed a full-scale demonstration that shows such treatment would result in taking a well that has 28 parts per billion of chromium-6 and without filtration and without uh, effluent that needed to be disposed of, converting everything to chrome-3, have to expose it to chlorine because they're required to chlorinate just like we are, and they uh, achieved results of between five and nine parts per billion. So a significant savings, however, it's all predicated on every aquifer's water quality. So we need to test it. And um, the Division of Finance has, has determined that, and we had a phone call with them uh, on January 31st, They've determined, uh, initially anyway, that since the state has removed the MCL for chromium-6, there is no longer a public health risk. <laughs> and, uh, so there isn't, so everybody's fine. Um, now, we know that they're still working on the MCL, right? So we'd like to continue to do our testing so that we can get better prepared. Uh, they've also, uh, pointed out to us that our proposed bench scale test for stannous chloride, while it has merit, would be researching a treatment methodology that is not officially recognized by the Department of Water Resources as one of their best available technologies. Therefore, Proposition 1 monies cannot fund such research and we should go to Prop 50. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and we have uh, initially uh, talked about organizing, uh, doing an organized shutdown of our grant and uh, the end loan, and since the state has removed the MCL, there's no public health risk. We know that they're coming out, and there will be a public health risk, we assume. Um, but uh, Noel and Gary hope that when the new MCL is brought out by the Division of Drinking Water, that there will be a compliance period. Uh, Don spoke to that uh, with uh, uh, Chrome 6 and Right, coral, TCP, one, two, three, or whatever it was. And at that time, they'd be willing to help us uh, find monies. So, uh, we called Eric Zuniga, Division of Drinking Water, our sanitary engineer for San Bernardino County, and um, he spoke with uh, Eugene Lung, the Riverside District Sanitary Engineer, and Sean McCarthy, who is the overall district uh, sanitary, uh, sanitary engineer, they would like us to continue to do our bench tests. So they have a meeting on uh, February 13th with the Division of Finance, and they are going to bring this particular issue up. Why, why they are interested in us continuing to do this work is that it has direct applicability, potentially has direct applicability to other small water districts, and by small, at this time I'm talking mutual water companies with 
100 connections, 200, 250 connections. Um, and it might also indicate a more economically feasible methodology. So while the state is considering their economic feasibility analysis, this technology is being researched, looked into by Coachella Valley, but right now nobody else is looking into it. And during our discussions uh, with the Division of Finance, I uh, compliment my staff because I asked them, okay, of all the other water agencies that have achieved grant and loan uh, assistance, how many of them have stopped researching uh, or looking into treatment methodologies? And he told me that there were very few other water districts in the state that had actually reached the point of a grant and or loan. And those that had applications still in the pipeline had withdrawn their applications. Wow. So kudos to the staff for getting this thing done, what, a year and a half ago? Yeah. Something like that. So that's where we are. Um, I'll give you an update on February 21st if we have one. Um, well, 14. Uh, Lynch Company, Constru Lynch Construction has begun rehab on well 14 as of February 7th. That's not right. Today's the 7th, the 5th. Yeah, with a, an expected completion date uh, in late March. And I am hopeful, as is the community and the board and the production people in particular, that this will be a successful endeavor. Our California Energy Commission solar grant scope of work has been prepared. Uh, our technical advisory committee has had the opportunity to comment on it. And they are moving forward with approval from the, the supervisor of this program to get bids from contractors. And we expect to hear something in three to four weeks on, on uh, what they can do for us uh, about energy efficiency, photovoltaic feasibility, other things like that. Um, we're ready to order vehicles, and that will be one of the items in tomorrow's special meeting. Um, and I mentioned the capital budgets, and I want to oh, talk about meter replacement, Mr. Ed. Uh, following up on the information provided by Ed, I contacted uh, about 29 Palms AMI meter replacement. Uh, I met with Ray Collish, and from that, staff and I have met with Vaughn Miller, representative from Inland Waterworks. Uh, we have provided them with the information we need to provide, and they are doing a propagation study for us, and we should hear something in a month. Uh, we have asked them for both AMR, which is drive-by meter reading, and AMI, which is putting up collectors, otherwise known as towers. telephone poles. Yeah, I don't want to say towers because yeah. we're not we're not we're not using any two hundred and fifty foot tall uh, surplus Southern California Edison transmission uh, lines or towers. So we'll see what that cost what that cost is and um, they are they are using a meter technology that has movable parts. Uh, we have been moving towards meters that have no moving parts because they last longer. The uh, I believe the uh, warranty on this uh, particular meter meter company made in Germany is uh, 25 years. Ours 15, 17 years ago was 15 years. It's, it's 20? Ten and now it's 20. Oh, now it's 20. Okay. System. So um, we're going to take a look at it and uh, see where those uh, costs come out. We're also going to be contacting the other meter companies that we also talked to before, see where they are. Uh, Vaughn Miller told us in that meeting that every meter company is moving towards meters that have no moving parts. So you now the question is, do we install... 4,500 new meters that have new me moving parts, or do we move ahead with what appears to be where all of the meter companies are going with non-moving part meters? I'm sure there are technical terms for that. Um, so that's meter replacement. And we've gotten several 
comments on the paymentus changeover. Um, we notified our customers that, that they needed to change their account numbers. So that, and the reason for it, and Susan help me out here, as I understand it, the reason for the changeover is so that the customers can have, I love this word, real time, as opposed to fake time, <coughs> can, can see their, when they pay, then they can go online and they see that their account is, is balance is zero rather than waiting week, yeah, weeks or more, yeah. Periodic. for the system to update the data. Um, a couple people are concerned about the uh, user friendliness of the Paymentus accounts. Paymentus can't go in and change your account. Those are your accounts. We can't go in and change your accounts. Those are your accounts for security purposes. But we have helped quite a few customers that have called us and walked them through it. And um, they're quite happy. And Susan received a complimentary call, or was it an email? A call. And somebody actually called to say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and when that happens, um, I want to re refer it to the, to the board. And this satisfied customer was very appreciative of the helpfulness and patience of Peggy in our customer service front desk uh, that Peggy gave her over the phone uh, two weeks ago. So we're here to help the customers. We can't go in and access their accounts. So uh, on that happy note, that's the end of my report. Unless you have any questions. Thank you, sir. Any questions for uh um, right. On the meters, Kurt. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> on the meters, when when it was talking about the meter replacement that uh, Twenty Nine Palms is looking at, from the beginning, had we been talking about the same apples to apples meters? No, no. The the meters are movable versus non movable, and. Um, we use, uh, most of our meters are three qu quarter inch or one inch meters, and uh, the meters that 29 Palms uses are, th are five eighths. Mm -hmm. So the cost of a five eighth meter uh, in 29 Palms through Inland Waterworks is $70, and the cost of a three quarter or one inch meter, same meter company, for us would be $130. So the collectors, the topography in 29 Palms is much flatter than it is out here. Uh, so the number of collectors and repeaters that you might have to put in at a cost of uh, some $5,000 for each collector, and roughly some $4,000 for each repeater. Um, we'll see. We'll see what uh, what they what they give us. Uh, you know, even at $75 for an MXU. And $130 for a meter, that is still less expensive than the other two meter companies that we have queried on this. And um, you know, when we talked to Vaughn, asked him why, he said because the company in Germany wants to get into the market. So, so we may have found something, and it's always good when the public comes with some good ideas. Thank you. But those are the ones with the moving parts, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is what's old technology. Oh. Yeah. Anybody else on the board? Thank you. Seeing none, Ed, please go up to the microphone so that we can get you on tape. Did you say those German ones were warranted for 25 years, though? Yeah, Kurt. Uh, Kurt. <laughs> Susan, correct me, but it's, it, it's 20. No, okay. the, new, the, the new ones are 25, yes. The, okay. the other ones we're looking at are 20. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and just to be clear, that warranty is not for 25 years. Right. <laughs> it's for 10 years, yeah. and then it's prorated Pro over the next. Yeah. Just as ours are now. Ours yeah. were 15. Mm -hmm. And so they're prorated for yeah, or 10, I think. If they wear out before 10 years, you get a new meter. Right. If they wear out 13 years. Yeah. You don't get all of your money back. Okay, hey, thank you very much. We will move on to direct reports on meetings attended, comments, and future agenda items. Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, 
Ms. Tracy. Karen Tracy, your Citizens Advisory Committee Chairperson. Um, we had a meeting in January, January 9th. We had one member of the committee missing, absent, and we had one board member present. Um, we got it. We got deep into the weeds on rever reserve funding <laughs> and what the definition of that was and all of the minutia ways that that breaks out. Um, we learned a lot of uh, vocabulary words like um, capital improvement plan and how when we didn't have one we didn't know how much money we needed to spend on capital improvement but now we have one we can focus on what we need to save to pay for capital improvement uh, there are a number of different reserve funds with different names and um, when that began to be described we learned about restricted funds versus unrestricted <coughs> funds um, we learned, for example, that the staff is currently writing on our behalf a reserve fund policy so that we have something that we can look at in writing as to how those funds will be held and designated for use. Um, as a result of the explanations, the definitions that we came to understand um, and how best to translate that to ratepayers that don't have working vocabularies like this, uh, we suggested that um, s using words or ideas, for example, that some of this money is, in fact, pretty much already spent. It's not really in a fund that we have access to. Uh, I think ratepayers would benefit from understanding a little bit more about that distinction. Um, that's not just my opinion. That's something that we settled on as a group. Um, we had lots of um, discussion about what words to use in place of already spent money, uh, emergency fallback funds, for example. Um, it seemed that one of the best ideas to help ratepayers like ourselves understand what's going on with funding uh, would be to emphasize the necessary spending on um, infrastructure from right where we are now going forward we have needs that are not met that have long been not met and kicked down the road and how important how important that was for us um, we talked about or it was mentioned that uh, the as the newsletter came out there were four items on the capital improvement fund that were of paramount importance, but there are in fact over 40 projects in the Capital Improvement Fund, which profoundly Im impressed me. I, that's, a, that's a big budget, and uh, maybe other ratepayers would, would be interested in that as well. Um, we went deep enough into the weeds to talk about um, what it would cost in increments to replace pipe. We have hun literally hundreds of miles of pipe, and per foot, it costs $100. Um, those are big numbers, and the ratepayers need to understand that just the cost of replacing pipe is astronomical. Um, we ended the, the meeting by talking about what's going to happen here on February 21st, and that is that the rate increases, um, everybody in this room probably already knows, the rate increases will be uh, presented to the public and the public will have an opportunity to discuss those. So that was kind of the bottom line of all of our efforts. Thank you very much. Thank Any you. questions for Karen? Anything from oh. the board? I would say uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the CAC is looking at, at reserves. And uh, Karen, you would have enjoyed the course I had today. In fact, it was taught by the guy that came in, David Becker, hmm. who gave us our reserve workshop that day and he gave a whole course on um, uh, special districts agency finances reserves uh, audits risk management great great course and uh, yeah you do get in the weeds a little bit <laughs> but I, I really I'm impressed you guys are taking it on that's great thank you thank you very much anybody else Seeing none, uh, the ASBCSD meeting, actually it was Kirby Brill speaking, and due to oh. a um, 
circumstances beyond my control. I never made it there, but I understand he was wonderful. So the Mojave Water Agency board meeting on January 21st, Director Flum. Anything exciting? Well, um, I forgot what Tom called it, monumental or, or something. We, uh, they, um, at the board meeting up there at Mojave, approved the uh, water storage agreement. There wasn't much, much discussion of that between the members of the, the board up there. And also the uh, pipe handover, the, the con whatever the connection pipe is from, uh, from where Mojave, um, the Mojave pipe ends here, Mojave Water Agency's pipe ends here and, and then goes partway, I think it's just partway across. Yes. Um, there's 20, a, 2,100 feet. Yeah, there's a segment of it there that uh, they actually owned and didn't intend to own it and uh, didn't want it and so it was handed over to us. Um, that was uh, approved by their board also. These two things were talked about at our previous board meeting uh, and approved here after much discussion and stuff. It was a lot of these things get discussed preliminarily um, and then these board meetings simply the board sign off on these things which is what uh, what occurred at these uh, at these two meetings. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I was at the Mojave Water Agency's Technical Advisory Committee meeting. There were two reports from the county. I must admit, I walked away and I'm thinking, I don't know what they talked about. <laughs> it didn't really seem to connect very much with water or us as far as I was concerned. So that was the last one. The next one, which is in two months, will be a field trip to the Victor Valley Wastewater Reclamation Authority, VVWRA, which should be fascinating, and I, I intend to go to that. So if anybody else is interested, we need to RSVP for that so that they have, I think we're going to meet it there at the VVWRA. But um, that's a project that provides a lot of water, reclaimed water for that the Mojave River. So it would be it's interesting to go to. Um, and I think we'll go through the directors at the end, but I will move now to the uh, public outreach consultant, Kathleen Ravnich. Greetings. <coughs> I have attended the uh, High Desert Water Summit, which is sponsored, if not totally put on, by Mojave Water Agency. It has uh, underwriters, other agencies. And they participate either financially or in personas. And we sent uh, Randy and myself and Sarah in different capacities and provided services. This was pretty phenomenal. It was a good thing to be part of. It's um, <coughs> well, Keith. Let's let me show him a snippet of this part. Is what Randy had a hand in, and then I'll briefly. This is the curiosity quest of which he helped as a adjudicator. You're not ready to back. There is sound, and you need to back it up to the beginning screen. I, I worked on the essay committee. See, it, it should start. And the essay committee are theme that the high school students, which involves some of the Morongo Basin students, they sent a bus in for them, mm -hmm. uh, had to do with taking the yuck factor out of recycled water. <laughs> and they had to write essays that were convincing, and then we selected, this is the essay group, the best message. The winner was then mentored in public speaking and that student won money and they got up in front of the whole all the schools that were there and delivered a more extensive presentation than what we were afforded and the runners up the two runners up were the MCs for the whole event so there was a lot of student energy throughout this entire program do you got the sound on that yet keep working it <laughs> it works on my apple. <laughs> and I will, I'll, I guess I'm going to have to just quickly say, they had, well, Randy, 
Be my guest. You were there. <laughs> yeah, they had uh, some uh, astounding students who came up with some great plans for conservation efforts. And uh, there was a How concept of a, of a dome oh, uh, uh, the, that there, could be placed over. Me, their oh, yes. The theme yes. was how to reuse a drop of water either at home or at school. Now. Mm. Um, so they came up with a range of uh, conservation dome, um, kind of the uh, public high schools where they have uh, the bathrooms and different things like that, where all the steam water and it can be collected, and um, and so some ideas like that. Also, um, the fountains that you know water that that flows out can be uh, put into a drain and then pumped out to fields. Different so different concepts along those lines, but very uh, innovative kids. Uh, uh, high school as well as uh, junior high as well, mm -hmm. uh, so it was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, they did a fantastic job. So oh. anyway, this guy, I don't get TV'd wherever he's on TV, but he's some guy that's popular for Curiosity Quest. Has anyone heard of Curiosity Quest? It's a PBS show, and this is going to air the entire, this is only a three minute kind of mm -hmm. lead, lead up to it, but their whole program is about two hours they're going to air this whole event of how the kids came up with their their solutions as teens and what have you. Now, my point is, this guy's always looking for things. So if we have any curiosity quest, he can develop his own program. You don't need students. It just happened this fit into it, the thing. But PBS is on curiosity quest looking for the the question and the answers. So this was kind of a cool event to just see how it all played out, the fact that it's going to be on TV. And he's really turned on to how we as communities solve problems. So just keeping that in mind. It was a great opportunity to interact. Sarah, uh, our HR Sarah, she went. She had the opportunity to interact with not just other professionals in the career field, but because the schools came in with all these counselors and teachers. There was a lot of talk about water careers that went back to the school. So it's not just those kids that were the captive audience. It's also the educators that we had the opportunity to impact. So it was a great, the whole thing was first class. I was very proud to be part of it. All right, moving on. Sorry about the sound. It was great. <laughs> Have to be there. Tune into PBS, I guess, in a couple weeks. <laughs> when I find out, they're going to let us know. Uh, the district tours, again, they're coming up February 22nd and 27th, and that is in the newsletter. Please spread the word. We have extra seats on the bus because we have a little bit bigger bus this time. Mm -hmm. So we can get more people on the tours. Also, keep your calendar marked for March 25th, the Water Education Day event. Right now we have about 38 outreach topics that are going to be explored or handled and it's going to be quite a busy little campus we have out here so that's my report. Thank you very much. Uh, it's not really on the agenda but I'm going to go through the, they have each director make any comments they wish to make. We need someone to put that in next time. We'll start with you. Did you love the, the weekend? I did. It was three oh, days so of really intense, and, and so all the glad. presenters, all the all the programs, all the courses were excellent. And I even got a chance to brag up our PR person, and because one of the things they covered was outreach. How do, how is your agency outreaching? And uh, I was a, I said, oh, I'm happy to tell. And I told about every everything that you know that you you help us with, Kathleen. And and speaking about your inserts in the in the monthly bill, those are really good. <coughs> and people are actually, Karen, I think they're actually learning some of the stuff that you guys talked about because that stuff makes it in there. And uh, so that's that's really great. And um, I was really pleased and I'm so thankful that this board and its infinite wisdom many years ago made educating its directors and its staff. Yeah. And you know, fuel crews, everybody made that a priority because it was really, really important. I met a lot of great people, people from the districts up uh, Redding, Biola, <laughs> Bombay Beach. I mean, people from all over the place, and it was it was really wonderful. So I'm very, very pleased. And I took the district tour for High Desert Water District. Beverly and I went on the bus, 
and went and uh, uh, saw a lot of their stuff, some of these things that we have. I know in our district tours, we see that SCADA. Mm -hmm. It's really impressive. It's like UNIVAC. It's, it's great. <laughs> so uh, definitely uh, get on those district tours. Got to see the SCADA. Oh. Thank you. Director Johnson. From back in the we, day. Um, uh -huh. Uh, are having a wonderful uh, Valentine's uh, party. It's called the Finance <laughs> Committee meeting. <laughs> I think I better start coming to these. <laughs> and uh, I was told that uh, Director uh, Luckman was going to bring candy, so I'm excited <laughs> about being there. <laughs> and I would just like to say uh, uh, thank you, Gary uh, Wilson, for your service, not only to the uh, United States Army, but to, uh, to the Joshua Basin Water District. Uh, rest in peace and Godspeed. Thank you. Dr. Hun. Uh, I wanted to uh, briefly mention that, uh, you know, talk about the um, our scoping and feasibility grant. I'm really pleased that it appears that we're going to be funded for that, for looking at energy efficiency and potential generation of uh, renewable energy for the district to help offset some of our energy production costs and I just wanted to compliment General Manager Sauer for getting right on that and getting a draft out of what the uh, um, scope of work would entail for that scoping and feasibility grant and we um, I commented a bit on it when uh, Kurt put it out to us for um, edits but we also had a member of our newly formed technical advisory committee also contribute to refining the, the scope of work, so it was great. And, uh, and I, I also want to mention that the Water Resources and Operations Committee is going to have a Valentine's Day party as well. That <laughs> <laughs> will we'll follow yeah, right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. What a morning. I guess I better load my pockets with candy. Director <laughs> Flom. Yes, the finance meeting. Uh, coming up February the 14th, uh, I promise I won't bring any more <laughs> of my notes about the uh, reserve policy, so don't be discouraged and uh, not attend, because <laughs> I, will, I will lay low on all of that stuff. Yeah, Gary Wilson, um, but to, to say the least, he's a man of many contradictions. Um, he, he, uh, he is quite quite singular. He's one of those uh, John Wayne kind of people that has an exponential mark o over his name, you know, like a like a uh, like John Wayne squared kind of a thing. Um, uh, he he's a complex guy, and there's strong feelings about him on uh, on both sides. And he did uh, he he goes he's got the kind of guy that'll go surf full circle and then go back again. But I wanted to point out that. Uh, uh, last summer, he came to the uh, to the uh, booth over at the uh, farmers market, and uh, the first thing out of his mouth was an apology to Kathleen for how hard he had been on her program over a long period of time. And uh, what what you don't know is that uh, his his granddaughter told me this the other day. The only reason he went to the farmer's market that day was to apologize to you for that. That was, And he also told her, his granddaughter, that uh, you are an important part of this organization and you do con your program contributes heavily to what goes on uh, in this water department. He said that too to her. And I just heard that the other day. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Uh, um, politics is politics. Who knows why people do what they do? And also people change their minds, simply. Um, but a uh, very nice funeral. Uh, we all went over to uh, Sizzler afterwards. The honors, um, because of his military service, were very emotional for the family. Uh, the family, uh, they tried to read a eulogy, but uh, uh, somebody from a little bit outside the family had to do that because people couldn't even speak. They were so overcome with it, but we all went over to Sizzler and had a good time uh, afterwards, and um, um, enough said. Thank you. And I will point the future meetings, the Mojave uh, Water Agency Board of Directors meeting, 
February 8th, that's tomorrow. You won't be able to go. I won't be able to go. Yeah. <coughs> Finance committee, he's already promoted that. Operations, resources and operations follows that. That's the really good meeting. Um, and and I do want to return this uh, meeting in memory of Gary Wilson. He was a, a member of this board when I first came on, and um, he had a huge impact on the district, and we owe him a lot. So in memory of, uh, of Mr. Wilson, I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Oh, the other thing I, I know what the other thing I wanted to say was, I hope all of the directors will get to go to the uh, weekend that she went to. It is absolutely vital for your, for you as a director that you have that education in the finance and all that stuff. It is invaluable. Absolutely. So absolutely. talk to Rebecca because I went and did it in three weekends, now they do it in one. Mm -hmm. So you come away, blah, blah, blah. but <laughs> it, was, it was three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Oh, was it? Yeah, <laughs> three full days. Yeah, it's well worth doing. So yeah. you guys who yeah. haven't done it, think about it. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you very much.